Okay, it is 1 p.m. and this is the Web Trans Working Group meeting at ITF 117. Uh, hopefully, David will be here soon, but I'll just go through the preliminaries. David said he would be here momentarily. Ah, okay. Well, maybe we'll wait a minute then. Yeah, let's give him a minute. We can always get started as we go. Also, Bernard, I just added a couple of flow control slides if you want to refresh. Uh, thanks, Eric. I'll reload. We'll see if that changes things. Thank you.
Eric, are you seeing your new slides? Should be a few after this. Keep going <clears throat> forwards. Should be at the end of H3. At the end of H3, ah, okay. Yeah. After that one, there should be a slide. After after this one. Yeah. yeah unfortunately, the next one is sometimes it gets stuck in the cache. Okay, yeah. uh, I think what I can do is try to do the screen share thingy and hopefully then it'll show up. Gotcha. Okay, hopefully this will be better. And now, Eric, here's your flow control slide. Yep. Excellent. Very cool. Yep. Okay, Thank let's you. do that instead. All right. Perfect. And we'll go back. Hi, David. <laughs> oh, you didn't see me here? I've been here all, the, all this time. Sorry, everyone. We've been futzing with the slides, so we're doing screen sharing instead of PDF sharing to get the latest uh, and greatest. But sounds anyway. great. Great time. Uh, which part, how much of the intro have we done? Uh, oh, man. <laughs> uh, should we get started? Yeah, why don't, why don't we get started? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Thursday. Uh, we're almost done. Then we get to sleep. Um, welcome to the web transport session at ITF 117. Uh, next slide. Uh, let me figure out. Uh, I'm one of your chairs, David Skenazi, and my co-chair, Bernard Aboba, is remote and controlling the slides in theory. Um, in theory. Uh, let's see. Uh, there it goes. In theory and hopefully soon, very soon in practice. So this is the note well. It is actually not on the screen, but it is but you it have a good for the note well. So it doesn't even need to be on the screen because you can't read anyway. The font is too small. If you haven't read it, please do. Um, I'll highlight two parts of it. One is the ITF's IPR policy, which requires you to, uh, thank you, to uh, anything that you discuss, be it on the list or at the microphone, if you are aware of a patent, you have to disclose that. You don't have to license it, you just have to disclose it. So be aware of that. And the other part is our code of conduct, which sets some rules and guidelines about how we collaborate as respectful colleagues. Um, all right. And if you have any concerns with any potential violation of such code of conduct, where the chairs are always happy to listen, and you can also report it to our area director or the ombuds team. Uh, but we are here to help and ensure everything goes smoothly. Uh, all right. You want to go to the um, meeting tips? In case this yeah. is your first session. Um, yeah, we, I totally prepared for this. I know the order of the slides by heart. Um, if, you're in, if you're in person, we have these blue sheets. Um, actually, Spencer, since you're up, can I ask you to hand this around? You don't actually need to sign the blue sheet, but by the act of grabbing it and sending it to the next person, that reminds you that you need to sign in to Meet Echo. Uh, <laughs> But yes, this is our uh, post-digital era where we now have printed out QR codes that we pass around. The future is now. Um, all right, and for remote folks, when you join, make sure your um, audio, your microphone and your video are off unless you're actively speaking. And the buttons look like this to raise your hand. We'll be using the virtual queue as we've been doing to ensure that remote people have as much access. And then once you get to the front of the queue, unmute and talk about whatever you want to talk about. 
All right. Uh, what haven't we covered in the intro, uh, Bernard? Uh, uh, here's some we, need, we, we need a note taker. Ah, right. Um, thank you, Needy. Much appreciated. All right. And then I will w watch the Jabber messages as well if I find the link. Uh, all right. Any any other message? Oh, yeah. Let's do the agenda bash. All right, this is our agenda. If it looks like every other agenda at the web transport session for the past two years, that's not a coincidence. We copied and pasted it and changed the numbers as per usual. Uh, so we're gonna be talking about where we're at with the W3C, then talk about H3, H3, and then wrap up. Would anyone like to bash this agenda? You'd need a good reason probably. All right. You could remove the numbers and it'd be easier. <laughs> You know, that's a great idea. It would save us some time. We don't pro particularly follow them anyway. Um, no, yeah, we were clear. Yes. Just one thing we didn't want to spend like 60 seconds talking about uh, Interop. Yeah, some... let's do that. Uh, Alan, you want to talk about that? Uh, okay, so I was not, I was at the web trans table for some of Saturday and some of Sunday, but not all of it. But uh, we have this new draft called the Devious Baton Protocol, uh, which can be run over web transport to exercise both streams and datagram functionality. Uh, and I think there are at least three implementations or maybe four. And they, I think, achieved at least some degree of interop with each other. Uh, I know Luke has one, I have one, Victor, and I lost someone else wrote another one. That's... Oh, Christians. Ah. And the JavaScript one. Okay, yeah. so there's a there's a bunch, and so if people are working on web transport and they want to try some interop, then we can. Yeah. So that's awesome. Thanks to everyone for working on this. The IETF uh, works on running code, and that's what's going to get us to standards that actually work. And so thanks for implementing it and testing it. And as per always, as you're implementing and something is a pain, remember to file an issue so we can fix it. Um, all right. Thank you, Alan. Um, next slide. Um, Will, I think that's you. Thanks. Testing. Okay, good afternoon. Will Law from Akamai. I co-chair the W3C Web Transport Working Group with, along with Yannivar Brewery, who's also online but I'll be presenting a short update here. And then we have some questions which can help unblock some of the current issues on the W3C side. And it was very, actually very useful. Last IETF, we had four, four issues we got feedback on and those did move those forward. So it's uh, the, the feedback we get here is, is very uh, useful. Status wise, we've updated the working graph. The latest version is July the 12th. Uh, that is the seventh uh, draft that that has been released by the group and it re represents the latest uh, version of the spec. Our charter is set to expire at the end of December. We're probably going to need to renew it again. We've already renewed it for one year and we'll, we'll renew it for another. We don't anticipate any problem with that. Timetable wise, we've slid two months from what I presented to you back in May. We're still hoping to get a candidate recommendation together by the end of September. And that might seem somewhat aggressive. But if you look at the milestone status beneath that, on the candidate recommendation side, we have 13 open, but 13 are ready for PR. So along, aside from the outstanding issues here, it just takes some, um, some PR work, uh, which is more of a mechanical uh, process than having to invent or uh, debate a solution. So if we can go to September 30, then timeline-wise, maybe in Q1 2024, we can actually release a recommendation. And we don't want to do that ahead of IETF, though. We should probably synchronize the two, so there should be some talk there. We have an annual face-to-face -face meeting for the W3C side, much like the IETF meeting here. It's only one per year. It is planned in Seville in Spain on Tuesday, September 12th from 5 to 6.30 p.m. Central European Summer Time. Uh, for those of you who can make it, please do. It will be online. Next slide, please. 
We wanted to summarize some of the major decisions and updates since March 29th, which was the time of the, the last update. Uh, in that time, there's been a send rate estimate added to stats. It's the estimated rate. I'm, I'm not going to read through all the text there. It basically gives you a rate at which data can be sent by the user agent in bits per second. And uh, it's also available for pooled connections with no pooling across origins. The rate applies to all streams and datagrams that share the web transport session. We've specified the uh, BF cache interaction. Uh, it will close the connection when navigating away. Uh, networking privacy improves uh, spec language. Support bring your own uh, buffer readers for datagrams. Sorry for the phone. Um, similar to web transport receive streams. Error code has been increased. Uh, error code length, sorry, has been increased. Um, you can add a send order uh, to incoming bidirectional streams and modify the send order creation. We're actually, we have an issue around this. We need to extend it, but this, this work was done in, in the gap. And we changed language so that the user agent should divide bandwidth fairly between all streams that aren't starved. Uh, and there's some nuances there when we talk about uh, send order and implicit uh, setting send order, there's an implicit group of streams that don't have any send order attached. So those are the, the major PRs that were pulled in. Next slide. This is an update from Mozilla. I thought Yanivar might want to give this since he works for Mozilla. Yanivar, are you online? Uh, yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's it's cute. It's metallic, but it's understandable. Uh oh. Okay. Um, well, uh, I hope you can make uh, out what I'm saying. Uh, I just want to announce that Web Transport is now in Firefox general release uh, version one four four one one four. This means we now have two independent implementations of Web Transport uh, in the wild uh, among browsers, and uh, Firefox. Uh, supports uh, our support includes datagrams as well as BYOB readers, which was the last minute feature and update from last meeting. And uh, our congestion control again is quick. Protocol implementation is largely written in Rust as part of our NECO HTTP3 support. We pass 93% of web platform tests. Yay. Um, and we have a few more features that aren't landed yet, including the send order that was mentioned, as well as get stats. And I added the link to uh, JS Fiddle for demo. Uh, there's also, we would love to run the mock demo, uh, which is more exciting. Uh, unfortunately, that's still uh, blocked on Web Codex, which is still upcoming in Firefox. But we hope to have that soon as well. And that's the update. Thank you. Thanks, Yannigar. Next slide. So we have a very wordy slide here. We apologize for that, but we wanted to present the problem and then we're posing a series of questions. And it's, it's hard to ask you a question and have to remember previous information. So we put it all on the one slide. This concerns priority groups. Okay, so prior work added the ability to opt streams into strict send ordering. It's an N64 send order number. Bigger the number, higher priority. Uh, it was designed with per media segment streams in mind. But if you consider two flows, one of which is adding streams with, say, per GOP, and the other is doing it per frame, you very quickly get out of sync on the number of, of your, your send orders. And if you wanted them to be fairly or equally sent, you would have to start multiplexing, like jumping with discontinuous send orders. It, it complicates the solution. So the proposal was to introduce explicit priority groups in the API to separate these flows uh, and basically create number spaces or namespaces for the send orders. And you can read the proposal there. Every writable in the session gets a priority group. There is a default group. All groups have equal fairness from a send priority standpoint. And within every group, you then interpret the uh, send order. There's a proposed API uh, below it. And there's two options. Either you can group equals new web transport send priority group, uh, and link it to the web transport connection as an attribute, or else it's a method off of uh, web transport itself. 
So a couple of questions that we'd appreciate feedback on. Firstly, is this group construct sufficient to meet expected media and non-media transmission needs? We, we don't want to add anything too complex, but we don't want to disable future uh, applications. That's question D. Question E, is currently fairness is implied between groups. Do we need an explicit weighting between these groups? In other words, if I have two groups of flows, I want one to receive twice as much of the available bandwidth as another. Thirdly, should datagrams be in their own group? And if so, what should the default weight be? Is it equal to streams, above streams, subservient to streams? Fourth, are groups actually flows? And we had proposed an API around flows uh, at the TPAC last year. Uh, it was not adopted, but when you start to think of priority groups, you are actually creating flows. And when applied to datagrams, it would allow you to send parallel flows of datagrams, which you cannot do today because datagrams fall into a big bucket. Fifth, if flows were implemented on the send side, is there any mechanism in the transport to replicate these flows on the receive side? And that would be a question for IETF. And then lastly, does such an application level priority group construct match or not match any web transport layer construct around prioritization and fairness? Let's see right. Thanks. Yeah, it sounds like if anyone has uh, qu thoughts on any of these questions or things, please join the queue. Mo, go ahead. Uh, Mo Zanetti, I think one of the things that may be missing is that uh, these applications are probably going to have a combination of different uh, media types uh, or uh, transport object types that they want to send. And it seems, um, it seems a bit hard to shoehorn all of this into a simple concept like strict ordering or even grouped ordering when you have things that are naturally application limited data flows like media, a very low rate media like audio, and then you know, moderate rate media like video versus file transfer type flows um, and things that are not application rate limited that could, that could saturate you know, immediately a link. It's very difficult to harmonize all those into one simple queuing discipline, one simple ordering, one simple priority uh, mechanism. And so I think there really needs to be thought about what are the application needs and do we really need to have different uh, carve outs for those different types of flows that you wanna send. If I wanna send application limited data, what are the, what are the parameters that I need to send? Is it you know, a, a rate limit for each one of them? If I have saturating data, what are the kinds of things that I want? And I doubt strict ordering or I doubt you know, group priority ordering are the kinds of things you wanna do there. So I think we really need to look at what the application semantics are for sending these objects. We may need different ordering priorities and even queuing disciplines for them. Okay. Do you have any suggestions for what these would be or could you open up I'm, an I'm issue? I'm actually working them? on a priority uh, draft right now. So I hope and have it done before this uh, session, before th this meeting, but um, it's still a work in progress. Uh, and it's, it's specific for a mock. It's not generic enough, but I think a lot of the same concepts apply across the board. It would, it would, it would apply equally to any, any application over quick, even H, HTTP streams. Um, so I'm happy to show you the, the work in progress point of that. And then we can um, get some of the early thoughts on that. Let's feed back to this. Thank you. Alan from, Alan from Dell, priority of meta, priority enthusiast. Um, my concern is that there are lots of, it's, it's going to be challenging to come up with an API for priorities that's going to meet every application need without, because most, many of these people have not written the applications yet. And so you're sort of in a, in a bind where you've got to come up with an API that you think is generic enough to handle every possible scenario. And, you know, we've been playing around with different APIs with H2 priority, H3 priority, extensions to H3 priority for a long time. And we're still kind of experimenting and iterating with it, server side implementation, et cetera. So I, I, I think you're, the best bet is to probably make something very simple that people can easily understand what they're trying to do and then also create something that is 
I don't know, like an up call where like when the user agent's ready to send a packet, it asks the JavaScript, like, which one of your things do you want to send next? So basically defer it all rather than trying to perfect this API between the application and, and the transport so that you can communicate that perfectly because I don't think you're going to be able to get one API that's going to cover everything without making it too messy and hard to use. Yeah. I think from the group side, there's no expectation of creating a complete and perfect API. The goal is actually to make the minimal API set now that attempts to meet the majority of needs without obvious blockers. So with what you said, would you still, we, we considered send order as, a, as, a, as an optional baseline and simple priority scheme that should be supported. Do you disagree with that? Oh, and I, if you do agree with it, do you consider groups another reasonable and simple extension or, or are you suggesting that groups grouping should not be supported? So send order seems simple enough to understand. I <clears throat> haven't ever written an application that tried to use it or an implementation to like measure if it's effectively doing what, if, if you're able to capture the application's intent, which is like one of the hardest parts of prioritization. And you know, it's easy enough to implement a queue that works that way when you're sending. Um, so I can't say, is it going to work? There was a time when people got together and thought this like amazing hierarchical tree structure was going to be like the greatest thing for prioritization, but nobody built anything with it. And then they found when you actually did long after the RFC shift, you're like, oh, it's really hard to capture the application intent. So I don't know. I think send order probably can be fine. I haven't thought a lot about groups and maybe it's okay, but I think if you're going to come up with if you do groups and you do order, I almost guarantee you that you're going to find some other application that's not going to work for them. And they'd be like, well, I, I need something else. And you're going to be, I don't know how easy it is for you to update, add new APIs. That's why I'm sort of suggesting some kind of a, a scheme that's like completely flexible, defers everything back to the application because I don't think you'll ever get the perfect API for expressing every use case. Thanks. Looking at RFC uh, 9218, uh, HTTP extensible priorities, um, there's the incremental flag. And if I understand send order correctly, what we have is basically uh, a lot of urgency groups and they are all incremental. I'm wondering if there's a need to uh, define a non-incremental uh, bucket as well. I think for compatibility, it seems there would be. Um, so that's a good suggestion. Victor was still a huge priority enthusiast. Uh, <laughs> I don't think we need incremental in case when we have the uh, in 64 priorities because you, you can just order things in the way you like to. For us, with eight, with, with three big priorities, I think it would be a huge amount. Uh, so, uh, regarding the up calls that Alan mentioned, that would be the ideal solution. Unfortunately, it is not really feasible to have an opto in JavaScript for every packet because that will make your browser, uh, your network stack perform extremely slow, uh, at least as far as what my current estimates are. It's, it's not really viable. Now, I have considered various solutions, uh, 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 one of which was a terrible thing called web DPF, which I will not mention for the rest of this meeting. Uh, uh, but in general, uh, I feel like this, the solution that is currently on the slide is like, tries to accommodate two problems while being as simple as possible. One is being able to stricter order streams and two is to have some carve outs between multiple strict orderings and uh, it is probably one of the simplest, uh, it's currently the simplest solutions that we found that seem to be at least like to some extent agreeable to all implementers. Uh, uh, I definitely understand that there are, might be use cases that are not addressed as well as use cases for which this is too much, but in general, uh, well, this seems at least promising in the sense that I can see it being actually implemented and shipped. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Mosinati, I agree with Alan that we should try to keep things simple, but I disagree that this is going to be, ever be simple. 
Um, I think if you look at the history of prioritization mechanisms, um, all the simple ones are we're always doomed to fail. Anything that I've heard a lot of people say, we just need you know strict ordering, and I'm convinced that that will never ever provide any useful semantic for for the majority of applications. If you look at the, the things which absolutely demand that you, you make prioritization work, thread scheduling, network layer queuing, all of those, you know, 20 or 30, 40 plus years worth of, you know, prioritization work, that can teach us a lot. And the mechanisms that we know have issues that are not useful to deploy in those areas probably are also not useful to deploy at application level areas too. And one of the things I see as a problem is that the application folks are just thinking of this purely in the application sense, not realizing that what you're going to interface down to is going to have queuing and it's going to have, it's not, it's going to have schedulers of its own. When you interface to your OS layers, there may be multiple queues available there. When that OS interfaces to drivers, there will be interfaces to probably have prioritization there and down to the network, there'll be more. So understanding how the application level prioritization semantics map all the way down to the delivery is an important thing. And trying to do it in a vacuum of just okay, I'll, I'll just manage my internal queues and hope that what I output, you know, works for the app. That's too naive, and I don't think this is a simple problem, and I don't think a simple solution is going to give the applications the performance that they want. I'm going to cut the in the interest of time. I'm going to cut the queue after Colin um, on the topic of priorities. So, <clears throat> uh, Luke here. Um, pretty much agree with everything Victor said. I think when you get down to the, the basis with send order, you, you don't have the callback you want in JavaScript where you get to choose which packet to send next. It's just not going to work. But send order, the fact that you can update it dynamically means you can, at any point in JavaScript, you can say, this is the next packet to send when your scheduler eventually wakes up and pulls the next packet. So it's really powerful. You, like Victor said, you can do incremental yourself. When you end the stream, you just change the send order. But um, I think this group abstraction is nice because one of the hard things to do with send order is round robining. You effectively have to set a timer and rapidly change the send orders if you want to do that. Um, and I think that this group abstraction is kind of what you get on the internet. You get these round robin flows. Um, so I think having that abstracting JavaScript is nice, it's simple. But yeah, I agree with everybody here. Like this, Prioritization is a never-ending topic. We'll never find a, a good or <laughs> a good even acceptable solution. So I think this is a, a good starting point, at least until we get more real-world data. Thanks. Fluffy. Uh, Colin James, I, I I was gonna ask about as a thought experiment, how much of this can be done as a polyfill on top of send order? I understand it's a little bit different, but it seems like you could get a very close approximation of this, uh, which made me wonder, hmm, if that's true, that's a hypothesis that you could basically get a very close approximation of this as a polyfill. Made me think like, nah, maybe we don't need it. Maybe we should just pump that over to the application or something. But um, I, I, you know, I, think, I think you need something, and I think you need something that maps to all the layers below you as well. And keep in mind this, you, this could be used a lot of different places with on a lot of different hardware and and it, and those all are going to have all kinds of cues well the same thing mo was saying except keep in mind that goes right down even to the nick card on any high performance system so good points thank you uh, go ahead victor make it quick though uh, i was going to answer to the Collins thought experiment it is possible to emulate this with send order if your strings are short uh, we have to accommodate also cases where, like, you have two strings that are long-lived file transfers, uh, that, and like they have to share them. So, from that perspective, you can't really simulate that with send order unless you like swap it every time. Uh, thanks, Victor. Uh, well, I think that was some useful information. Should we go to the yeah? Can we go slide? to the next slide? If we have to, we have one more slide. Uh, this issue is a little simpler. Perhaps not, though. Um, <laughs> Don't jinx it. <laughs> retransmissions in send order. So should new data on, higher, on a higher send order stream preempt retransmissions of data that's been lost and is now being retransmitted on a lower send order priority stream? So some questions. Should there be a Boolean API to toggle whether retransmissions should inherit, inherit the stream order 
the send order of the stream, uh, which they lie within? Should there be an API to specify a time window within which it makes sense that the retransmissions be given priority, but then after that, because they're too far behind live, they don't, they're not important and you would simply do higher priority. Number three, this may not be a problem at all if transmissions are rare and short lived. And number four, this may not be a problem at all because lower priority streams can be aborted by the sender. Any opinions on these items? Uh, I'll be really quick. I mean, if you just did this by default, it would be a disaster. It would completely defeat the purpose of prioritization in the first place. And it would mean that on lossy networks, you had a completely different priority inversions from other networks. It would be impossible to design an application that sat on top of this. Now, if I can imagine saying you're going to set two or send orders, that the application can set two different priorities, which may be higher or lower each other in any particular order, about how retransmissions, what, what the, you know, one send order for the main packets and one send order for retransmissions. I can't imagine that working, but you have to pass that up to the application to control, or this will just, or, or you'll have complete inversions that are impossible to debug. Colin, can you clarify when he's saying when it or this, what were you oh, referring sorry. to? So if, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's very bad. So the, the application, um, you know, you design an application, you think it's going to be, it's prioritizing, you know, you got so, something here and then something that's sitting at a higher priority of it. And suddenly you're losing stuff here. So suddenly the, the, the system, depending on the packet loss in the systems, which ones of your streams get priority over top or each other start changing. That's a very, very difficult thing to design for. And remember priorities are mostly, everybody thinks about them about improving the priority of something, but usually you're trying to make something worse, not make something better. And this is when I'm deliberately trying to make this stream worse, suddenly if I have packet loss on it, you're going to make the, 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 the application running JavaScript is trying to make it better. And the, the underlying web tr transport implementation is depending on network loss is trying to completely circumvent what the application was trying to attempt to do here. So I don't think you should do that. So I think that the, if you're going to do anything in this space, you should be allow the application to uh, set a send order, to, to set two send orders effectively, one for retransmissions, one for not retransmissions. And I don't think that you should assume which one of those will be bigger than the other. Okay, thanks. Hi, so um, I implemented this. Uh, I done retransmissions based on send order and without it. There's no difference, honestly. Like it's, it's, it's really quite like, Yes, in theory, if you send retransmissions according to their new send order, like if you have a stream that was high priority and now by the time you need to retransmit it's lower priority, there's some flow control issues. Like if you don't retransmit it, it's hard to do right. And honestly, just send that packet. Like, <laughs> you know, like unless your packet loss rate is really high, it won't make a difference. Um, so I think this just leave it undefined personally. Like it's just up to the implementation, what they do and in that case, defer to the easiest thing, which is just always retransmit first. Otherwise, flow control is hell. Um, you just run into this case where you've got gaps and streams that still consume flow control. Mozanati, I like Colin's idea of having uh, a specific uh, retransmission send order because I would like to use that as a hack to avoid having to do datagram implementations. Uh, if I can, if I can lower the, uh, you know, put the floor the lowest floor value of my retransmissions as a hack for, for uh, doing datagrams, and I can still use the stream semantics. I think that's a pretty cool thing to do. Uh, speaking as an individual contributor, as a datagram enthusiast, I'm very mad that you would consider not implementing datagrams. That's not how it's supposed to be. That's it. If datagrams didn't require extensions for a hundred other things and didn't require fights with everyone that doesn't want to do datagrams, I would also be happy to do datagrams. But there's a lot of non-datagram enthusiasts. Uh, well, send them my way. I'll, I'll, I'll teach, uh, teach more, them our ways. More specifically, datagram murder enthusiasts, I think uh, it would be closer to what they are. Oh, boy. No, actually, I didn't know that. No. Huh. Hmm. OK. So I think that concludes W3C section. Thank you all for your input. We'll take the notes back to, to the W3C region. Thank you very much, Will. And just to double check, you're taking the action item of summarizing this conversation into the W3C issue? Uh, yes. 
Thank you. For the remote folks, he said, I guess I am, which I heard just said as yes. Um, <laughs> all right, Eric. Just real quickly while Eric's coming up, if anyone wants to continue discussion about priorities, uh, there's SF Video Media tonight from 6 to 8 that Ollie Began's going to be able to do a presentation on priorities that was booted out of the mock session. Um, so if anyone wants to rap about it there, it's tonight, 6 to 8. Who doesn't want to talk about priorities? Uh, Alan from Dell, mock co-chair. No one was booted. We ran out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Defer that presentation to another time. So you're saying the presentation wasn't prioritized? That joke was already made, David. Follow our list. <laughs> Bop. <laughs> Dangerous games we're playing here. All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about H2. Only a couple of slides here. Um, not super major updates, which I think is starting to show that, that a lot of these documents are becoming pretty mature. Um, we submitted a draft 06, which adds initial flow control limits. Those work in two different ways. There are settings. So you can say, hey, on this overall connection, every new session that you start is going to have these initial flow control limits. And then separately, we have a header field, which is the web transport init one. Um, and that lets you get a uh, set of defaults that you can provide within each session uh, as you send the connector request and response and all of that. Um, so that's a little bit nice. Uh, next slide, please. We also updated some of the examples to make life easier for implementers. Next slide, please. And other than that, the question becomes, what's left? So one of them is uh, error handling, which I think we're pretty much ready to uh, write up, but we'll have a slide about that in a second. And then the other one is we filed a bunch of new issues um, from some implementation experience, which is fun because we haven't historically had as many H2 implementations, but now we have some uh, some good code happening and, and some things that we're finding as we do a close reading of some of those documents. So that's fantastic. Um, next slide, please. Error handling. So this is a fun one because way back when in a much lower numbered IETF, we said, let's do the same thing that H3 does because that sounds like a good idea. Uh, and then a little while later, we said, if you discover a problem in H2, you can just reset the stream and the whole web transport session is gone. That's a really nice way to handle errors. So uh, I think the proposal is let's do that, um, which is not that different from what H3 does, but like you don't have all these other streams that have led off into the rest of your H3 connection that you have to go chase down. Um, here you have a single H2 stream and if you nuke it, then your stream is gone. Excellent, I see no one diving for the mic to tell us that that's a terrible idea. Does anyone have thoughts? I see a thumbs up. Any more thumbs up from the room? Yeah, all right. Any any thumbs down? No. All right. Well, we're just going to assume that people are okay with this, unless if you disagree, please come up now. Sounds good. All right, next slide, please. So one of those things uh, from implementation experience is a question about final size. So this is an interesting one because uh, when we pulled over the reset stream capsule to look a little bit like the quick reset stream frame, and I stuck them both on the slide here, um, you'll notice that we skipped this field called final size. And if we go to the next slide, we said, that's not an accident. We'll put in a paragraph here, or really a sentence or two, uh, that explains why we did that. And we said, well, we don't have a final size. In-order delivery of WT stream capsules ensures that the amount of session level flow control consumed by a stream is always known by both endpoints. And depending on how awake you are after whatever delicious foods you ate for lunch, um, that may or may not make a lot of sense to you. But one of the questions is, next slide, is that actually sufficient? Um, so this is a place where we'd really like some input. Um, we know that final size is especially useful for things like flow control, where you need to be able to say, um, hey, this is how far I had gotten by the time you, uh, by the time you said this is gone. And uh, in H3, that's especially important because things can come in out of order. And so some of the data that's going can, you, can you know, show up ahead or behind of, of a reset. Um, Is everybody okay if we leave that out? Isn't it kind of nice for the person on the other side to say, hey, here's how much I'd actually processed by the time this is going away? Or how big I think this was? So 
Victor, go ahead this time, but use the Q tool otherwise. Uh, I have a question. So what does HTTP2 itself do? Ah, that's a good question. I think we just reset the stream. There's no final size. Uh, it, it sounds like we're fine with our final size. Okay. Alan for Dell. Is, remind me, because I've forgotten, is this the only difference between the capsules that form web transport over H2 and the frames that make up quick? Or this the absence of this field in this frame? I think so. So I, I kind of want it back because I kind of want to have one parser for both. Um, but I lost that argument a while ago. So I don't know we, if anybody we, wants we to revisit it now while we're here, but I agree. You do, I don't think you ever need it uh, to perform flow control reasons. You should always know, I think, when you get the reset. That was the question. Because I mean, we, we, we did discuss the, the parser code reuse, et cetera, at, at length. Um, and I think the question is, is there any new information, especially as we're actually implementing it of, hey, I would have liked to use that size to do blank, which is a little bit different than, hey, I would have liked to use my parser to ignore it. Okay, I have no such information. Although I'm curious, I know I keep asking this and forgetting the answer, who has implemented some or all of web transport over H2? I think we have at least two people in this room who are doing that. Okay, I would love to hear from them how this works. Can you clarify what you mean by consumed? <laughs> As in, has the web transport implementation read it versus has the application read it? That's not what the final size is for. The final yeah. size is how much data have I sent on the stream. And how much data was sent on the stream should be obvious in H2 because of the ordering requirement. Because your reset would have to come in after it. Which I think was our reasoning originally when we were saying, hey, it's nice that we want to use the same parser, but we don't really need this. Cool. All right, next slide, please. That oh, sounds like a right. pretty clear answer. Yeah, so just for the minutes, it sounds like we're good with keeping it without the um, without the final size, right? Does, if anyone objects to that, please come up, but sounds good. Go ahead. <clears throat> the last one here, um, this is a bunch of stuff that I think we kind of assumed, but not actually put in the document. And so as we read that document more closely, uh, maybe there's some nice editorial text that we should add. And so I just wanted to run this by everybody to make sure that we were all looking at this text and saying, yes, this sounds like a reasonable thing to say. Uh, the two principles here are one, um, when we talk about max sessions, after you've said, hey, my max sessions is 10, you can't turn around and say, no, actually, it's five. Just kidding. You broke all the rules. You're so bad, and I'm so upset with you. Um, so if you, if you promise somebody some flow control space, you can't renege on that promise. That's usually a principle we apply to all flow control everywhere, but we never actually wrote that down. And the other one here um, is the streaming limits being cumulative. Um, and we said the word cumulative in the draft, but uh, as we read it and try to explain it, it seemed less clear than it could be. Um, and so I was thinking maybe an example would be helpful. Uh, so for example, if I said you can have 10 streams, that does not mean that you can have 10 concurrent streams. And if you open 10 and then close one, you now have room for one more. That says you can have a total number of streams that have ever been opened, and that number is 10. And so if you open 10 streams and then close one, you do not get to open another one until I say that you can have a total lifetime number of streams that is 11. And at that point, you can open one more. Um, and judging by some of the expressions of the people in this room, it seems like it would definitely be worth writing down some example similar to that, rather than just relying on the heavy lifting of the word cumulative. Thoughts, feelings, is this how we want it to work? Well, Mosin, I think it's important to clarify this terminology because I had this uh, similar argument about max streams with with many people that I thought knew much more about quick than I did. And I was floored that, that they were under the mis, you know, misinterpretation that it's, oh, you can open five more if max streams is five. Um, so I think that's something very important to clarify for all implementers. Thank you, yeah. And we can, we can bake in a cute little example or something like that to make life really easy. I'm not sure if cumulative is right word. You know, stream number is, you know, it's, it's the stream numbers that, that you're really setting limits on, not how many, not a count of them, but the actual, value, the string numbers are the thing that matters. Yeah, we could name it that way and, and run it in that direction. I think right now it's a little bit wishy-washy as to whether it's actually that or if it's the count of them that are then every other. And so it's slightly different. 
Um, but let's let's say, let's at least straighten that out um, and remove some of the confusion there. All right. Sounds like we have consensus on this one that editorial clarification is a good idea. If you disagree, come on up, but let's go ahead. And in that happy case, next slide. Victor. Thank you, Eric. Any other questions about H2? Otherwise, let's go to H3. This is easy. There are three issues. Uh, and uh, the first one is. Uh, huh? yeah, okay. I'll just take it in your hand. It's way easier. Just pull on it. Yep. Just, yep. P -p pull it towards you. There you go. Uh, all right. Key exporters. Uh, so uh, people have uh, filed an issue in WC3C bug tracker for the API that there should be an API to provide key exporters since this is something that uh, quick libraries generally provide by TLS libraries and uh, some people find that useful. Uh, and I started writing an API feature and noticed that there is an issue that if you have multiple sessions, they probably should have different space for key exporter. So that's a protocol issue. So I wrote up a proposal how to derive key exporters for web transport session. Uh, and uh, in general, we seem to agree that the proposal is sound, but there were also questions raised as to whether having key exporters in the protocol or the API is in general useful. Uh, so if uh, you believe those are useful, please uh, come to the mic line. Uh, Martin. Yes, it was me who opened this proposal. And um, I'm sorry, I haven't seen your, your sketch of a solution yet, so I can't uh, comment on that oh, one. OK, the solution is really simple. The solution is like you uh, have a derivation that is similar. Like TLS has kind of have derivation from like the, I think it's like from the master secret you derive the exporter secret with like some strings. So here is similar except from the ex like exporter secret you derive uh, uh, the one that binds uh, the specifically the session ID. So you put the session ID in a, in, in a context or something like that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, that, that, that's generally how it works. But it provides the same API as TLS, except it like also binds the session ID. OK, yeah, that sounds reasonable reasonable to me, but I, I don't know a lot about crypto. So, uh. so, so b before we jump into how to build this, let's talk about why we built this. Uh, do you have any, can you, do you have any use cases for this? Yes, I know a guy from the HTTP working group who's writing a draft about unprompted authentication. And uh, to build something similar to this on top of web transport, it would be really helpful to have access to a key exporter. OK, and are you intending to build some? I'm just trying to look for use cases. Don't take this as me disagreeing. Yes, and I, what, what I, would you build with that? I, I do have a use case um, exactly for that. Oh, and what is it? Um, maybe we can take that offline. OK, fair enough. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Bernard? use case, which is uh, I would claim that this will not be useful for end-to-end -end encryption in mock or RTP or for hop-by-hop -hop encryption in RTP. So I'm not sure there's, I, I can't think of any use case for media. And uh, there's some media-oriented people here. If anyone can think of one, please come up, but I can't. And Bernard, just clarifying, I'm assuming that was as an individual contributor, right? Right. Right. Basically, the, the thing is, this would be, anything you would do would be hop by hop, so you can't use it end to end. And Quick already provides end to end security services. Uh, sorry, hop by hop security services. Right. So you, you don't really, in my opinion, it's not needed. But Mo, if you have an opinion, please come up. No, I, no, I agree with Bernard. I don't. I don't think there's a need for this. Um, I don't. I don't see unless you, uh, unless an app, unless we wanted some applications to have some interoperable ways to do things. I don't think this is necessary. It's like a like a helper. The applications can do it. You want to give them a helper, they can they can get their own library for, for a helper. 
No, this is specifically to ensure that whatever you're doing is bound to the specific TLS channel you have between the client and the server. What do you mean by bound? Uh, it means you cannot like you cannot set up a scheme in which you have now you authenticate to one party and to use the server you think you're talking, but you, it really is proxying the authentication <clears throat> to another entity. That is the typical use case for key exporters. That, Binding. But all, all these exporters, you just they just add another label into you know the, the current key material, some fixed label that identifies the exporter type that you're asking for. So I don't see how that's really going to give any kind of binding. It doesn't bind to anything. It just gives you another permutation of the key material that you have with some fixed label. That's all you get from the exporter. Yeah. It's not binding anything. Okay, you as a TLS client or server have access to that key, but the web application does not. That's an important distinction here. Okay. At the, I'm still thinking like Bernard. I, I don't see a, I don't see applications uh, needing this. A quick question: Can you explain what this even means? Like, does this impact the transport, or is this just an API thing? It is an API thing, but it needs like a, some well-defined semantics of how to interact with TLS. So generally, it's an API to a TLS section that provides you a key material that is derived from like the secret of the TLS section key. I'm saying this would be like a W3C API, right? Yeah. It wouldn't, it, not changing anything on the wire. Yeah. yeah, this does not like actually add any burden to any implementations that are not like browsers or servers that actually use this. Yeah, just to provide some context, this has been used in, in stuff like DTLS SRDP or an EAP TLS. Those are, those are the things that use exporters currently, but I don't think any of those things relate to web transport. Okay, I, I'm getting a sense, uh, speaking as chair, that this sounds more like a W3C issue to some extent, given that it's really specific about like a layer that can access the key material that makes a secure thing of generating the, the export and then handing it to the JavaScript, which cannot. Um, and it sounds like we have um, not a whole lot of use cases here. Martin seems to have one, but some folks are saying that there's not enough need. I propose um, to kind of send this to the W3C and ask over there uh, if they have use cases and if the WCC comes back saying there is a strong need for this, then we would add it. But my gut feeling as chair is that right now there's not consensus to add this at this time. So Martin, since you seem to be the, the main proponent, can I ask you to file an issue at the W3C and try to get more use cases listed there? Thanks uh, so for the minutes Martin says said we'll do. Okay, let's go to the next issue. Uh, protocol version negotiation. Uh, okay, it's just a recap. Uh, in draft 02 version of the protocol, we negotiated that we support web transport using the setting that's called uh, settings enable web transport, or the full name is settings enable web transport draft 02, because it was the version of the protocol that, uh, that negotiated. Uh, current, we added a mandatory setting that's called settings web transfer <coughs> max sessions that is currently used in a similar way. Uh, and it is currently, you're required to send it in both directions. Server has to send to the client max settings, uh, max sessions, because by default, max sessions are zero. So it means you can't open web transport. So you can send max sessions of once, which means you can only open one web transport session on the connection. Or you can open it more than one if you, as a server, are willing to process more than one session uh, at a time. Uh, and on the client, we currently require you to send this, but this value has to be any value that is non zero. The reason we're required to send it is the way we currently perform web transport extension version negotiation is uh, the client 
offers multiple versions and the server offers multiple versions and the versions that ends up being supported is the max version that is both supported by the server and the client. Uh, there is a proposal uh, that we stop doing that and we require settings web transfer max sections to be only sent on the server and not on the client. Uh, I see Eric is in the queue and he was one of the big proponents of this, so I'll let him speak more about that. Uh, Eric can hear Apple. Yeah, so I think we'd kind of been talking ourselves around <clears throat> to a place where we were thinking it was okay to not require both sides to send this. Um, there's lots of ways to do version negotiation here. Um, if we want to mint, mint version specific uh, tokens for use with the protocol header in the extended connect. We can always keep using settings web transport max sessions with different code points from the server. Uh, but given that we're still in a place where we require the client to uh, initiate web transport sessions, it seems as though the server can still offer versions and the client can pick that version and initiate web transport with that version that it knows the server supports. And so uh, perhaps what we're doing interop for some of the draft versions and stuff. It was nice to have both sides kind of agree to some extent on a version, but uh, anything other than our typical, you know, here's the set of what I am willing to let you talk to me with and the client can come and knock on the door and say, hey, I picked this one. Um, it doesn't seem like we actually need anything more than that long term. My personal position, I, I, I went back and forth on it. I first did not like this proposal, then I decided that I like it. Then I went and implemented Draft07 support in uh, the Google Quick implementation and decided that at this point, I really don't like it. And the reason I don't like it, it is really easy to write code when you know which version of the protocol you're speaking. Uh, and as soon as you lose like certainty as a version and have to like be really flexible, you now have to think like, oh, in this version of the draft, I defined frame foo. Uh, but in this version, I defined frame v2. And like you then, well, if they're different in semantics, you can vary between foo and foo version two. But now you are like, Okay, as a receiver, I can process this, but now as a sender, I need to figure. I support both versions. I need to figure out which one I support, and I need to do that both on the client and on the server. So I tried to come up with that logic, and I found it extremely painful to deal with. So I have a strong preference for a scheme in which the both peers have at any pro point that they speak, they know which exact versions are speaking. Uh, that is my current personal position. Uh, do people have other thoughts? I, about I, I'm a little, just a clarifying question, Victor. Yeah. I, I, unless I'm misunderstanding, it sounds like what you're saying doesn't quite match your slide, or am I misunderstanding? This, this slide is the explanation of the proposal as it was written up. Okay. Uh, uh, as a, as a, yeah. So I, I kind of feel like there were two proposals. Was, uh, well, okay. well, this one and one from Eric on the on the issue, where both of them say we only send the setting from the server and not from the client, and then one of them, let's say, call it yours, is when we change, we renumber the capsules, and Eric's proposal is when we change, we change twiddle the value of the upgrade token. A am I understanding this correctly? Either is fine. I think the, the thing you would twiddle in the first proposal is the setting code point, uh, which is how we advertise support for web transport anyway, right? Wait, but then what's that? So wait, 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 right now you send settings web transport max sessions to something other than zero. And tomorrow we have web transport v2 and I send a different HTTP setting, which is settings web transport two max sessions, and that is some number that is greater than zero. Right. And at that point, the, I think one of the questions is, it's completely reasonable to say that, you know, when I'm writing a bunch of code, I'd like to know what version is in use when I'm going to go send some frames. Uh, but you are required to have that setting before you can talk web transport at all. Uh, so before you're sending any capsules 
or any frames that are related to web transport, you would have that setting present. Oh, uh, you, you would have it, but you need that setting from the peer. How, how do you know which version client is actually speaking? Oh, when the client sends the connect request, that's why you wouldn't mess with the upgrade token, yeah. Uh, so, so that's why I think just to, again, I think I'm trying to synthesize here and not express an opinion. The server sends this setting and it can send two separate settings if it supports two versions of web transport. And then when the client picks one, you're suggesting that it uses a different upgrade token to tell which one. And I think Victor's saying that it uses different capsules to indicate which one. Well, well, that is that is one possibility. So the problem with specifically using upgrade token is one upgrade token is per request. So you can send different upgrade tokens. You can send like the web transfer to be one and web transfer to be two. Uh, and this is problematic because they could change the behavior of your parser and that state is global per connection. Okay, then, then what are you proposing, Victor? I'm not understanding uh, the technical proposal. Uh, I'm just proposing status quo. Uh, oh, okay, so your proposal is not what says proposal on the slide. Uh, yeah, I think this was supposed to be, this was, was the issue said that Eric was supposed to write this slide? Gasp. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think, so if I'm understanding correctly, Victor, what you're saying is that the client and the server both send this setting, as okay. many copies of this setting as they need to for whatever they do. Yeah. And we use our little max of max of max to uh, figure out that that's the version that everybody's talking. Uh, and I think the, the counter proposal was, it's a little bit annoying as a client to say, hey, I support 10 sessions when you can't open anything. Yeah, when that doesn't all. really mean right. anything. Um, and that was fine. It was nice to go down to just one setting instead of having dual settings for that. So like, I'll take that over having two settings. Um, but that prompted the question, why do we need to do a max of max of max if we could have the server say, I support these versions and the client then picks one, which is often how we do version negotiation given that the client is the one who has to initiate all the settings anyway. Are those, if you speak zero RTT, are those necessarily in that order? We did all this fun stuff for how you save and remember settings for zero RTT. Yeah, I, I just like, when you zero RTT, the client settings come first and then the server setting and then the client settings again, and then you merge all of them. Uh, no, for zero RTT, the client has remembered the settings from the previous connection for the server. All right. Well, it sounds like this is quite confused. Um, so we're going to take it back to the issue. But uh, Martin, Luke, if you want to put some quick comments in. I'm confused by the max of max of max. Should that be the max of the intersection of the two versions? I think. Yes, sorry. It is max of it. I, I just realized that this is not exactly. It's max of like. Yeah, the intersection of the two sets. Yeah. yeah. Um, and my question is, I, I wasn't aware that the client had to wait for the server settings before it sends its own settings. Is that a requirement, that uh, round trip? No. In fact, yeah. this does not require it. Yeah. Like, this computation can be performed only when you have both of them. Uh, but you can, but the settings are sent independently. That's why you, client puts all version it supports and server puts all version it supports. Yeah, so my, my preference would be the client optimistically sends the settings frame with no knowledge of the server settings frame. Um, so it just doesn't, it's not forced to incur a round trip if there's, you know, the server's settings is lost or something. All right, so, so I think we have two clear proposals. Well, clear might be a strong word. We, I think we have two slightly clearer proposals. One, one is both of them send settings and then when you get both, you do the max of the intersection set. And the other proposal is the server only sends and then the client sends it in the upgrade token. Um, I'm going to do a quick show of hands just to see. And if it's not clear, then we'll take it back to the issue. But just as an attempt to resolve this, does, does this sound like a question that I can ask the group? I don't know. I'm seeing Fluffy making very confused eyes at me. I'm just confused. I, 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 ignore me. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, everybody uh, else. Uh, all right, then. Actually, anyone in the audience. Part of my confusion came from what's on the slide is completely and totally wrong, and everyone else understood that, but I 
took oh. me a little while. No, no, trust me, it took me quite a while as well. Yes. Uh, uh, please raise your hand if you're not confused. Not I'm not raising my hand. All right, so I guess we can't ask the question because there's too much confusion. Let's take it back to the issue and maybe next time let's do a better slide. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll do the slide, fine. And then you can make fun uh, of me. This slide is actually, uh, uh, I think Eric is supposed to talk about. So. I was gonna say, if you want some less good slides. Challenge accepted. All right, I'm gonna stand over here because it's fun to confuse people. Um, one of the last things to talk about in H3 is uh, this document that Martin did a lot of the, the heavy lifting. Um, and thank you, Martin, somewhere, um, for writing up some of the stuff for, uh, can we go back? Bernard, do you mind going back a slide? Thank you. Um, I wanted to stare at the name of the header for a little longer. Uh, so there, there's a document that writes up some of uh, how you would do session limits for flow control and, and stuff like that in H3. Um, obviously, some of this depends on the documenting quick for being able to tell how many streams are actually open and when they were closed. Um, but the other thing that's worth talking about here is, is we also kind of mentioned we could do the same thing that we did in H2, where we include the header for web transport in it to include all the different initial values and, and all of that stuff. And so I think uh, that's one thing that would be good to get some feedback on is, you know, if we're doing this, do we want it to match the way we did in H2? Do we think it's actually useful having that header? All of that stuff. Um, general thumbs up, thumbs down, that kind of idea. Cool, all right, next slide. And the main overview here is it grabs the same capsules that we used for H2, makes a WT max data, max streams, um, and then the blocked variants of those. Uh, and the important part here is because in H3, every web transport stream is split out into its own H3 stream, we just use the uh, native flow control there. And so we don't have a max stream data capsule. Um, otherwise, all you're doing is just the very straightforward thing, which says, hey, here's your total amount of data that you can have outstanding on the session. You say, here's the total number of streams that you can have inside of this group of streams that we call a web transport session. Um, and all the other layers of flow control work just like they used to. Uh, nothing super new, nothing, nothing super fancy. Um, it turns out the, the actual text to specify this is, is uh, pretty straightforward, very analogous to how it already works in H3, very analogous to how things work um, in H2. Did not end up being nearly as, as painful as we were concerned it might be. And that is the end of that. Uh, so I guess that is the proposal. Now the question here is, uh, uh, do we want to do this? And do we want to always do this? Do we want to require this? Do we want to require this in some cases? Or do we want to just not do this ever and like decide that? The mic line is open for answering that exact question, or by which I mean these 17 questions. Oh, well, this multiple choice buffet. Alan from Dell, not running out of memory enthusiast. Um, I know that I wanted this because I don't want to run out of memory, but I, right now I don't feel like implementing it today. So um, I'm guessing that other people have implemented Maybe they're further along and they're like, yeah, I'm, everything works great. And I'm ready to like make sure that I have this like additional flow controller working. And maybe they already wrote the one for H2 and they just kind of pop it into H3. Um, so I like that we have it, but I'm not ready to commit to it. Like, yes, we must include this right now. I don't know where that leaves us. So Alan, are you suggesting you're inclined to support this, but you want to implement it first before you decide, except you don't want to implement it right now, so we wait. Um, I, I don't know. I think, well, I think it's a good idea in the long run. I think if we don't do it, then we may regret that decision later. Um, but I'm also not like, just based on, I feel very behind implementing web transport and like jumping this on there is like going to put me further behind. So. I don't know. I, I feel like Victor is like, I feel like this. <laughs> so Alan is ambivalent. So 
Unfortunately, I think this is required if you use session pooling. I, I just don't want a world where some background tab is causing my foreground tab to, to be starved because, I don't know, JS is just throttling it. Um, so I feel like if you need to do session pooling, you do also need to do web transport flow control. That being said, I, I don't want to do session pooling. Um, personally, I want to set max sessions to one and never implement this. Um, so I would like this to be optional in some way. Uh, actually, uh, st stay there. That's, that's a very good point. Here, here's a straw man. We could say that this is only required when, there, when the max sessions is more than one. How do you add that to the list? How do you feel about that? It also depends if H3 is eating your flow control as well. Um, again, personally, I'm not doing H3 and web transport together, but I think that is a that is a better than requiring this for sure, sir. <laughs> for sure. Or, or require, we could also say requiring it if the connection has something is not dedicated to a single web transport session. So, so that, that would be a proposal that would work yeah, for you, for so. example? If max sessions is greater than, than one, then I have to do flow control, I think, is a fair requirement. OK. All right. And uh, Alan, can you get back in the queue just for that one? I would love to, or quickly, what, what, does really that? I'm skeptical how you're going to prevent additional HTTP requests on this connection. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I don't know how you do that. Well, oh. in our implementation, it's just it, it's not fed into the connection pool. Right, well, I mean, you're saying you must implement this if you said it. Uh, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't know how you enforce this must and, and what that means. Well, I mean, we we would have to, okay, so, so maybe let, let's not rat hole on how we exactly say, but say only require this when you're doing pooling, some, some hand wave, hand wave. Some contour of that did sound a few. Okay, um, all right. But I'm, the details matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that's what we're really good at, right? Holding on the details, so we're in good shape. Uh, Eric? So I think that that's kind of the, the challenge with that approach is we'd said it shouldn't matter if you pool or not. Each web transport session that you have should not be able to tell everyone else that may or may not be present. And I think the, the place where that runs into issues is when you have other H3 traffic as well. And so... Sure, you can say just don't put it into the connection pool, and, and that's kind of a little bit nice hand wave, hand wave. Um, but if we're saying our, our general principle is each web transport session is its own thing and shouldn't be able to be stalled out, killed, run out of memory by other tab X, other thing you did Y, um, you kind of end up needing to be able to do this. When you say, hey, if, if max sessions is one, um, what you're really saying is we still have this, we just call it by different things and we use the existing H3 flow control. Um, so it's not like the bugs you're going to have in flow control are going to be any different. Um, it's just you have a, a small delta of additional limits within your session. I don't know. I kind of end up in the, in the shrug phase of what Alan said, which is I don't think anybody's like, oh, yes, this is the best thing I'd always love to add to my web transport session. Um, but I do think we end up in a place where we're kind of sad that we don't have it down the line. Thank you. Lucas Pardy, <laughs> flow control bug unenthusiast. Like, I'm at, I'm at where Alan is. I'm lagging behind in implementations. And, and the idea of, like, having to do this as well doesn't fill me with joy, but it could be something that we want. Like, I, I just, yeah, like, how can we test this and make sure we don't keep adding more flow control bugs that just like make everyone's day bad. That could be a question for the EDM uh, stream in, in things or, or the interrupt testing or the web platform tests that we're doing. But I, I just, I, I don't know. I wouldn't say no. Can we defer for a while? Is it going to hurt anyone if we did? I don't want to take forever to do this, but it doesn't seem, is it urgent? To me, it's not. So just. To clarifying question on that, are you saying that we could publish web transport with this not in it and add it later? Or are you saying, can we defer for now before our publication? The latter. We should make the decision before publication. Trying to retrofit that after the fact is, is, is I don't think we, we can make that decision yet. Later down the road, maybe we decide actually we'll do web transport version one without flow control and V2 without. Uh, no, don't do that. But that might be the decision future us 
can make when we've done some implementations and convince ourselves maybe actually we were just uh, over over indexing on, on what we think the problems are. Thank you. Uh, Martin. I agree. We shouldn't ship this um, ship multi session without flow control. Um, so I'd, I'd rather go through the pain and implement it now, um, rather than doing that later and then potentially delaying the document um, because people still need to implement this proposal. Thanks. All right. So the sense I'm getting from the room. Oh, go go for it, Victor. Yeah, since I can't actually put myself in secure. Uh, ah. so. My specific proposal would be for the course of actions that I have and I think will work. So there are, in the browser, there are two ways you can create a web transport. You can create it with, uh, without the flags that tells you to allow pulling, or you create it with a flag that tells you to allow pulling. So this creates a possibility that if we ship this as an extension, what we will do is if you do not request pulling, you'll get a dedicated quick connection where your web transport is the only thing that's on this connection and you don't need this and everything is fine. Now, if you're asking for pulling, what happens is the browser will attempt to reach to its like HTTP free session pull uh, and it will find the connection on which it could potentially open this web transport session. Uh, and if it finds it, can, and when it finds that, it has to check some criteria. And one of the obvious criteria is that, well, does this session support web transport? And we could add another criteria whether it supports web transport with flow control. So you would require both. And if you don't support flow control, you would fall back to the dedicated session, and uh, that will work out just fine. So this is one path forward I see, which would unblock the dedicated case, uh, but would still leave us the room to handle the nested flow control correctly. Does this idea sound reasonable to people? Right. Bernard, I'm unlocking the queue because I think this is the last slide and we're, we have like more than 30 minutes on the uh, clock, so... Does that sound all right? Yeah, so I was coming up just to talk about this too, which is uh, funny. But um, would anybody do session pooling without flow control? As in, would you have multiple, let's say, tabs that share a quick connection but don't have flow control? Because that seems like deadlock central. It seems like it's very easy to starve. So I think what you're saying, Victor, where I think ses max sessions and flow control are bait bound. Well, well max sessions is not an... No, max session is a declaration of a server from what it supports. It is distinct from what the client is actually going to do. Okay, well, I mean, and like ultimately, the decision to pull or not to pull is a client's decision. Yeah, so if you oh. pull, that means you also support flow control. Is that a, is that a requirement? Well, I think yes, but that's also. I want to know if there's anybody in the room that wants to do session pooling but doesn't want to do flow control. That's a good question. Um, love to get folks' opinion. And if you do, please come up. Um, otherwise, uh, of course, other things in the queue are welcome. Uh, yes, Eric? I don't want to do that, but I think we're in this weird spot where like, if I say no pooling, we need to be super clear about whether that is no pooling with other web transport or no pooling with other random get requests on that H3 connection. So et cetera, et cetera. currently, at least in Chrome, no pooling means Whenever you ask something with no pulling, I will go and create a dedicated connection and it will not go anywhere in the stack. Which is a fun thing, but not necessarily what setting max sessions to one means. Well, yes, so we should... it's, it's what setting the API flap on the client things. Did we write that down? Uh, I will try to make sure that the text is extremely clear. On it. And the reason that this behaves is not even like due to like pulling a deadlock. It's the reason is that if you do that, you have much clearer expectations around things like stats and estimated congestion controller state and stuff like that. That's the other reason we have that. 
Lucas Pardew responding to the question. I think I, what I don't have a good handle on is I hear a lot about client sides doing things and what does it mean to support these things? Like I need to go and update my mind on this back because I've walked in late as well. So you know, shoot me. But like uh, supporting things versus like not is ambiguous to me. If we're going to say, yeah, I can do something, but then a client chooses not to do that, what position does it put me in? Is the expectation that me supporting flow control is I will not overflow the client or I can put a flow control on what the client can send to me. Obviously, web transfer is a bi-directional thing. So that's what I'm unclear on. And if I need to go and do some homework, I will. But I just want to make sure the discussion is reflective of. I, I think in this case, when we say support flow control, this means if you both client and the server say that they are support those frames, they will send those frames and will uh, uh, will honor those, the limits that those frames impose. So doesn't that put us over in a weird position because it's saying like, maybe I would if if you chose to do it. Like, I don't know, let, let me go away and see. But that, that would be my general concern. That it's maybe not as symmetrical as it sounds. But I'm, I'm happy to be in the rough there. Thanks, Lucas. I mean, it does sound like if we decided to make this tied to pooling, we'd have to write down exactly how. And I think some people need to see the how before they decide if they're okay with it or not, because it sounds like the how might not be trivial. Uh, okay, Bernard? I, I have a little bit of a concern about how we would roll us out and the effect on the API, because right now, you know, we don't have pooling in the client, so nobody's really using this. Um, and uh, am I correct, uh, Victor, that this would be JavaScript ob observable? Uh, I actually believe this is, to some extent, JavaScript neutral in the sense that you currently have to already handle the situations where you run, off, uh, run out of connection global flow control limits. This is just adding extra limits on top of existing limits. So you already have to handle limits, but they might change the way they behave. Right, right. Um, so I, I'm thinking kind of like how you would introduce this. I think you would have to introduce it along with pooling and maybe, uh, well, at that time, people would begin to observe changes in behavior in their apps. So uh, it's, a, it's just a little bit tricky. I, I personally would probably not use this and wouldn't use pooling either. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think in some sense, it's probably good to understand it now and have it in the spec. But um, I, I think, you know, it would be one of those things you'd have to test with developers to think if they if they get it or, or understand the behavior. Alan Rindell. So responding to the question, would I, would I do pooling without this? I think the answer is no. Um, so it's fine for me to let those states get coupled. Um, it's still, and I, don't, I think I need to think about it more as well, but it, it's still strange to me that you can put these limits on the web transport pieces, but there is no mechanism to limit what the H3 side can do. Um, and so the H3, you could try to be very careful to make sure that web transport doesn't eat your H3 data, but H3 can eat your web transport data. I don't know if we need to solve that or not. Thanks, uh, MD. Oh, convenient. I don't think this is a problem. Um, because define this. I'm oh, sorry, the, the, the thing that Adam was talking about. I don't think it's a problem because I, as far as I'm aware, that if your connection's choked up and you can't make more HTTP requests, then it's fine. Um, you just make another connection, client wise. Yeah. If Web Transport eats the entire whatever resource on that on this list that that, that might be exhausted, then you can make another connection. And and the other way is definitely always going to be the problem. Um, so I, I, I really don't get why you would add extra complexity here. By Like, we need these things. 
it's easier to always implement these things. So I don't know why you would try to not have them. So, yeah, yeah that's not lazy. I mean, if we, if we agree that we need them in, in any context, then we might as well have them in every context, as far as I'm concerned. So, so MT, to clarify your position, you're saying that uh, the idea of having this optional and only when there's pooling, you don't like that? Yeah, very much don't like that. I was okay. just going to quickly ask, is there ever a limit on how many connections you can make? Uh, I don't know if there's any written down anywhere. Like we, in, back in the olden days, we used to say two connections to any one server, and that that doesn't make any sense anymore. Um, we're more or less down to one for the most part for HTTP. But as soon as web transport comes into the picture, I think um, the number of connections might be equal to the number of web transport sessions plus one. Worst case. Marco Munisaya. Uh, I, I, I see like a lot of complexity in like implementing stacked flow controllers, uh, but, and, and I might've missed this, so apologies, but what's the benefit that we're getting when we're like pulling these sessions or pulling the connections? So I think that that was something that we, we talked about a while back, which is in HTTP through and HTTP three, you can have multiple requests on the same connection. And we, we decided like, oh, well, web transport is an HTTP request. So unless we do anything special, it might end up on a connection with other things. Do we want to allow that or not? And the decision at the time was, yes, we want to allow that because it allows you, for example, if they're on the same host, to have your gets and your posts and your transfer all within one envelope, one transport connection and one encryption context. Um, to interject with that, I think given the amount of hoops we're usually willing to jump through to save round trips um, in other areas, that seems- That's another good reason, yeah, yeah. thanks. So yeah, th those were the motivations. Um, we, we, I think that there was an in a sense in the room that Pooling was going to be hard, so we said I'd oh, support it, but no one implemented it. Um, but yeah, turns out it is hard. Um, so, uh, let's see who who's next in the queue. Sorry. Uh, oh hi. Um, really quickly, I think uh, to what Bernard was saying about kind of impact on on apps and and in the JavaScript land. Um, I think part of the point here is that a pooled web transport session and a non-pooled web transport session should not appear to be meaningfully different to a JavaScript developer. And this is part of how we make that happen. But fundamentally saying, hey, I want a dedicated connection when I create my web transport session and, and having a pool there to say this doesn't allow pooling versus this does allow pooling if that makes your app work better, then we screwed up somewhere. Because like, if you say, hey, I, I need my own dedicated one because it feels good and I'm special and I want to go fast. Um, and then what's going to happen? The browser's going to start sending the same UDP packets from maybe the same five tuple, maybe a different five tuple. Like, and you're going to hit a queue that is lower in the stack that you probably communicate with less well, like you're not getting there any actually faster. Um, so yeah, there's, there, there's minimal complexity that we're going to have to do anyway. Um, but I mean, I, I could see an argument that you shouldn't even in the constructor be able to say this is allowed to pool or not, because if you can do that and observe a difference, then like we have a bug. Yep. Thanks, Eric. Martin? There's also the option to say, uh, to solve this problem at a different layer, namely the quick layer. Um, I'm not sure if that's the right layer to solve it, but it would solve the problem of having um, HTTP 3 eat all your web transport streams, which this proposal cannot prevent. Um, a while back, I wrote up a proposal. I don't think I posted it to the list um, 
how to define stream groups inside of uh, Quick, and then you could you would basically have separate limits for, for groups, and then you could assign all your HTTP stream, streams to one group and all your web transport streams to, to another group. Just throwing this out there. Thanks, Martin. Luke? Uh, I wanted to ask Victor a question, because I think you mentioned something important that I don't know if anybody else caught on. Uh, you said when Chrome, you establish a web transport connection, and then it sounded like you no longer use that quick connection for any H3 request going forward. Correct. That this connection, in fact, is not related to any pools. It yeah. is like entirely owned by your JavaScript object. Yeah. So based on that implementation detail, at least, at least how Chrome's implemented, you do not, web transport and H3 do not share a quick connection um, if you disable pooling. Yeah. Uh, specifically, it's like if you disable for the correct set, if you do not enable pulling. Yeah, and you said that was necessary to implement some of the web transport API? It is not entirely necessary, okay. but if you are relying on things like your congestion controller providing your estimates for your send rate and things like that, uh, congestion control state is uh, uh, connection global, so if you pull, this does not work. Clarification question. If I'm asking my congestion controller to provide me an estimate of a send rate, and I have a non-pooled second web transport over here right next to it that's going to try to send at the same rate, is my congestion controller not equally wrong, but now it doesn't know what it's talking about? Well, congestion to, if you have two competing connections, they can provide you correct send rates because competing connections, congestion control will equalize them. And like you will have like correct estimate of half of your bandwidth in long term. But you can also just do that with your one that knows about. That is a completely different problem that is much harder to solve. Yeah, but I like that is like you are trying to do bandwidth allocation on your client. As opposed to doing it by accident where you don't know about it or have any. Well, it is not by accident. The network does it for you. Yes. Yeah, so that's kind of my preferred. Well, the way you've implemented it is my preferred way is kind of like a uh, web socket where you just take over the connection. No more pulling, no sharing, Expo you know, use quick flow control, use quick uh, uh, congestion control. So that might even be an option too, like almost like a third mode. You have like dedicated connection. I can share with H3 or I can also share with web transport other sessions. I hate adding a third enum to the. I don't really <laughs> think there is like that much difference between like sharing with only HTTP and sharing with HTTP and other web transport. Because if you're sharing with things, you're it's, you have all the like sharing with things problems. Uh, Mozanetti, I think the uh, the reasons for having different connections seem to be mostly around multiplexing and congestion control. So. Uh, uh, we assume that the condition control has a good design so that it's distributed. So if you create two connections, yes, they won't necessarily fight each other, but that's a distributed decision that you hope that your algorithm converges between the two. But if you put them in the same connection, then you have a central congestion control that can understand and it knows it doesn't have to guess or rely on its, its theoretical uh, fairness of a distributed you know, uh, flow control. You can have them under a single context and and, and do it that way. And you, and you don't have any multiplexing when you have multiple connections. So there's, you know, there's an efficiency loss if you're relying on multiplexing, which is, you know, probably the main advantage of quick period. Um, so I think it's, it's, uh, it's not good to, to want to bar one or the other. If someone wants separate connections because they want to be independent, that's fine. But if someone wants the efficiency and single congestion control context of pooled connections, we shouldn't you know, we, we shouldn't cause uh, those people to, to suffer. And to Martin's point, um, not liking uh, the this being optional, I heard the arguments for not wanting to do this is laziness. And Martin's argument against it is don't be lazy, just do this. I don't see why it's 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 uh, it's so hard. To just if you don't care about it, set it to a giant number. If you don't care about these these limits and you don't want to actively manage the flow control. Just set a giant number and be done. You can be lazy and and still set a giant number and be lazy. And then it satisfies Martin's desire of having uniformity. There's not if this, then that, then this parameter applies. It doesn't. You can always have this parameter globally. And the people that are lazy, just set it to a nonsensical high number. Well, laziness is part of this, but 
also part of the issue is that when you have a dedicated connection to yourself, it is not just not necessary. It is redundant with the connection level flow control. You're but, just but, effectively doing the same thing you're already doing. But if, if, you do, if, if you effectively don't care about this, you could just set it to a, a huge number. Well, what, what, is, what is that harm? What's the, what's the downside other than having to do that one setting? There's no technical harm, right? Thanks, Mo. Bernard? Yeah, there, there's just, just one comment, which is uh, people uh, mentioned that when you don't have pooling, that you get the connection to yourself, you get a bandwidth estimate, which is just for your app. The other aspect of pooling, aside from having to share bandwidth, is also having to share the congestion window. And that's actually not a negligible thing because when you're sending keyframes, the congestion window actually is what determines your latency. So the keyframes are often bigger than the congestion window and require multiple RTTs. So not understanding what that is or having it affected, it actually can affect, it can improve your efficiency to pool. Like in particular, if a bunch of stuff pushes up the congestion window, you know, when you start sending media, you'll, you'll discover that suddenly your keyframes get through a lot faster than they would have otherwise. So anyway, that's another thing to understand. But as was noted, if you're going to pool, you really have to have glow, you know, understand exactly what's being sent to manage your app. It's, it's your responsibility. Thanks, Bernard. Spencer? Spencer Dawkins. I just wanted to rewind back to what Eric said and agree with him about the idea of applications getting different uh, behavior using pooled and non-pooled connections. Um, I wanted to add on top of that that if it turns out that applications can do that. There's a pretty good chance that application developers will try to exploit that. And then it, it will be up to transport people to try to unwind uh, what happens so that they, so that they can make sure that you can't tell them, you know, get different behavior. And that, that just seems like something we might be able to head off by saying, why pool? Lucas Pardew, um, responding to, to Mo's point about like just set big numbers and it kind of the problem goes away. In my experience, having implemented and debugged things to do with quick level flow control, it doesn't work because you've got a load of accountancy that needs to be happening. It's not just related to these frames, but the other things that we're doing, like when you reset the stream, uh, do you get some of that flow control back or not? Like there's there's many ways we can do this. If you're not lazy, you do the work, but there's there's edges that are just tricky. And, and so if we do this, you have to do it properly and that's okay, but you can't do it and be lazy and do it because you will hit issues. Uh, just cause interrupt failures that are incredibly difficult to debug. And that yeah. And even if you do it, you're not guaranteed that your peer will do it. Correct. And, and that, so that, again, that goes back to my earlier point that if I was a server, I'm not as good as the client with all its stuff. Like I go, yeah, it's fine. Like, and yeah. I do something, there's an upstream failure and I need to close some, some parts of the web transport session and not others. You end up in some situation where there's a mismatch in the accountancy on both points. And, and that's terrible. Like, again, there's examples of this happening and, and being fixed eventually. And I just don't want to retread our mistakes. If that could be covered with interrupt testing, brilliant. But I think we would need some people to, to put some thought into that. Thanks, Lucas. Luke? Last time to the mic, I swear. Um, but replying to, to Mo, if you just set these to infinite values, you're going to run into the quick flow control. Um, and what's going to happen is you're going to have, um, again, a background tab that is just not reading from streams for whatever reason. If you make a new tab that then makes a pooled connection that joins an existing connection, it immediately hits the quick flow control limits and it deadlocks. Like it's not, it's unresponsive. Um, whereas if you make a brand new connection, you get brand new flow control and you're unblocked immediately. So I think without flow control, you can't accomplish that dream of having pooled and non-pooled connections appearing the same to the application. You effectively need to make sure that the sum of all the flow controls for every session is less than the quick flow control. And, and I think, and that's the only way you can accomplish that dream. And I, that seems hard too. 
knows an idea. Yeah, the, the, if you don't use these, then they're effectively infinite because you're only subject to quick. If you do use these, you're still subject to quick, but you're also subject to this on top of it. So it seems like it's the exact same semantic if, you, if the app is dumb and sets these to infinite or these don't exist for the app. It would still be, in both cases, you're only subject to the quick flow control, right? So it seems like it's the same thing whether you require this all the time and set it to something nonsensical or you only require it sometimes and in that case, it's the same as still requiring it and setting it to something huge. Thanks. Wow, we have drained this queue. So let, let's see if I can try to synthesize a few of those points. Um, I think we have a bunch of agreement that um, we can't do pooling without some kind of flow control, otherwise bad things happen. Um, and it, I think we also have agreement that, uh, or that one I'm a bit less sure, so speak up if you disagree, on this property that if you select uh, be pooled or be not pooled, it shouldn't be too visible to the JavaScript. Um, and I think we have agreement that that means that you need flow control in both cases, because if you only have it in one and not the other, then you can detect that difference. Um, so that kind of points to, we therefore need flow control. Uh, what I'm also hearing is flow control is hard and we're engineers, we are therefore lazy. That's part of the job requirements. Um, so we need to do this. No one wants to do it now. So the sense I'm getting is we, kind of maybe put a pin in this in terms of like not necessarily you know requiring it in the spec right now but i'm getting i'm hearing that we we're not no, no one wants to ship this until we've actually figured this out so maybe what we need is implementation experience from this and then we can revisit this conversation um does that make sense Wow, we agreed on a few things. That's nice. Um, all right, I'll type that up in the issue. Um, any, uh, what's on the next slide, Bernard? It's a wrap up, so this is the right. last slide and then we'll live. All right, any other topics around H3 or questions for Victor? Well, the answer is probably no, so. All right. Um, we do have 13 minutes left. Any other business that folks would like to discuss? I see our friendly AD. Uh, Murray, area director enthusiast, I guess. Um, just <laughs> No, you're an area director. I'm an area director enthusiast. OK, all right. Um, just a quick thing. I heard much earlier that both of the tracks of stuff you're working on are getting close to last call, or there wasn't much left largely to do. Just reminding you, Francesca's out for still another month. So if you pub wreck anything, please email me because I won't. I don't see her pub wrecks. Gotcha. I I would dream to live in a world where we send something your way in less than a month, but I don't. I'm not too worried. If you don't, that's totally fine too. <laughs> awesome. All right. And that uh, Bernard, you anything, or should we wrap up? Yeah, I, I think uh, we're ready to wrap, although um, if we have action items for us, David, maybe we should uh, discuss what they might be. Uh, is there anything that we need to do, like consensus calls or other follow-up for the notes? Um, I think, I mean, I'm going to, I've been typing up what we get agreement on in the room and the issues. Um, I think some of these were pretty minor, so we don't need to, like, do formal con like confirmations on the list for anything. Um, yeah, I think we're, uh, I'm not thinking anything. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, go for it, Alan. Uh, Alan from Dell. So I, I, I see that we've made lots of good progress in closing lots of stuff. And though we're not in the world where we're going to send a publish request in the next month, do we have a sense of with how it's going to play out from here over the coming time period. Uh, sure. That's what are we going to be done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to go home. I'm hungry. Yeah. And that's, um, 
So I think in terms of what we need, uh, a big, uh, I think for various things, uh, the blocker is implementation because we don't want to ship specs that aren't implemented right. and deployed. So like take for H3, we have uh, dependency on the reliable stream reset draft in Quick, which is making good progress. Thanks, Martin Kazuo. Right. Um, and that needs implementation. Uh, the H2 document doesn't have any dependencies, but it, that needs way more implementation. Um, and then in the H3, so one of the things, did we ever figure out what we wanted to do about the server initiated bidirectional streams in H3? I thought of kind of remembered we needed to write a document in HTTP BIS and then no one actually did that. Is that going to like just pop out of the woodwork and then delay us by a year? Um, does anyone care or should I go talk to the uh, HTTP BIS chairs? Is that a Tommy in the back? <laughs> uh, all right, I think I'll take an action item there. The chairs talk to the other chairs, but that was like a year ago and I don't remember things that far back. Um, so we'll do that. But anyway, yeah, we're making good progress. I think what we need is much more implementation and then wrapping up dependencies. And we're, but we're already get, getting closer to done. And there's also yeah. similarly in the W3C, things are progressing quite well as well. Uh, so, yeah, David, is it correct to say that we've, that 07 is the last draft that we believe will have breaking changes? Uh, uh, you know, or, if we say that, we're going to jinx it. I, I don't okay. want to. <laughs> Okay, I'm just wondering if there's if at some point we're going to declare an interop testing event or something like that, but I don't think we're quite there. Yeah. Should we have interop? Should we schedule an interop testing event? Either are we fine waiting until Prague? Do we want to set up another time target in the interim to try to accelerate progress, keep people honest? Because I only work on web transport in the week before ITF. Uh, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, thoughts from other implementers? Is there any time in the, I don't know, September, October time frame that sounds like a fun time to type some web transport code? All right, I get a yawn from the audience. <laughs> all right, let's take it to the list and discuss there. Um, all right, thanks everyone for coming thanks. and contributing. Thanks in particular to Needy for taking minutes, much appreciated. And uh, thanks again for a pleasant meeting. See you all on the list and on GitHub, and we'll see you in Prague.